Good evening and welcome to Wide Angle. In slightly over a month, the election results will be out and a new government will take over. What is the foreign policy agenda that it will be faced with? Joining me today to explore this issue are our two distinguished panelists, Mr. Prem Shankar Jha, senior journalist, author, columnist, editor, former media advisor to Prime Minister V.P. Singh and visiting professor at a number of universities, and Dr. Gemini Bhagwati, former High Commissioner to the UK and currently professor at ICRIER, who has, over the last 36 years, held key positions in the Foreign Ministry, Finance Ministry and also the World Bank. Welcome to both of you. There are two trends that appear. One is the re-emergence of Asia on the global scene or the rise of China with all its attendant implications, both regional and global. And the second is the gradual reintegration of India into the global economy, a process that began more than two decades ago. Now, this is, of course, in addition to the problems that we have in our neighborhood, which, as we all know, is a very complex neighborhood. How does all this translate into the foreign policy agenda for the new government? Mr. Jha. Well, I think the, the our stance on global uh, developments and our stance on uh, our neighborhood are now very closely intertwined. Uh, globalization has actually changed the entire political as well as not just economic, but also the political uh, in, in interplay and the, st the structure of the international state system itself is undergoing rapid change. Uh, and we uh, have to find a policy that actually serves our interests both there and at the same time within the, uh, with, with our neighbors, uh, which in fact is in keeping with, in consonance with our long-term interests. We, I don't believe we have done so, so far. And this is a, a major, major challenge that we face. The specifically, uh, this relates to China uh, and to a lesser extent with Pakistan. Um, but it also relates to attitudes to the Arab Spring, for example, and the way that it has been handled or mishandled by the West. It relates to some of the issues that are coming up on the use of unilateral sanctions, the abuse of unilateral sanctions. And I think that these are issues that we have to look at and really see our long-term interests instead of looking at it in the old way of bilateral uh, connections with particular countries and also reactive foreign policies, waiting for someone to do something and then reacting to it. Dr. Bhagwati, in terms of long-term interests, how do you look at the long-term interests? I suppose the long-term interests would be defined to a great extent by the geographical position that India has and secondly by the economic linkages that India will develop and is developing today with the rest of the world. My sense is that uh, sometimes we make the mistake of putting strategic political and security issues in one watertight compartment and the economic issues in another when we deal with the world outside. And uh, I think with the new beginning, with the new government, <coughs> pardon me, which will come uh, into office uh, in the second half of May, we can try and look how best we can integrate some of these uh, policy initiatives that the new government will take. And very specifically, uh, let me give you a number. Uh, our imports from ASEAN plus Northeast Asian countries is uh, roughly about 24% of our total imports. Our exports to the very same countries uh, is about 28% of our total. Under these circumstances, whether we call it Look East, whether we call it by some other name, we need to be thinking a little more carefully. You mentioned, Mr. Jha, you talked about the rise of China. How do you see the implications of the rise of China, the attendant US rebalancing in Asia, the implications of this dynamic, this particular relationship playing out, and the impact it has on India in particular? Well, the rise of China has been very, very uh, spectacular 
but it's not the same kind of rise as might have been a similar rise in the 19th century at that speed particularly would have been much more frightening reason is that china's rise is based upon exports to the europe and the and the usa 80% of the jobs created in the last 20 years in china have been in the export sector and the chinese know it very well so their goal vis-a-vis -vis the world as a whole is actually a peaceful one they they need peace for con to continue this, this this progress against that what they are finding is that they are getting incre incredibly nervous increasingly nervous for two reasons one is that the domestically their economy economy is in serious trouble there's it it's choking on in its own past unutilizable investment and they don't know and a recession is therefore set in which they can't do anything about in the past export growth used to cushion this this has happened before uh, two twice at least before in the last 20 years um, but this time both export growth and domestic over investment and therefore recession have come at the same time and it has come at a time when also the credibility of the party uh, in 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 relation to the, the its mandate of heaven that the communist party has enjoyed is now practically in tatters uh, so they have got enormous problems to deal with at home and at the same time they are facing increasing pressure and they're getting seriously worried about some of the uses that are being put to financial sanctions for example unilateral sanctions now what is a unilateral sanction when in 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 the area of credit if there are only two credit card companies in the world effectively which have 90% of 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 the business and they both happen to be located in america what is unilateral about obama picking up the phone and saying the us wants this to be done the sanction is affects the credit the credit worthiness of anybody in china or the chinese government itself throughout the whole world Yes. Okay, so these are these are issues that they are <coughs> feel they have to uh, tackle. The Arab Spring for the Chinese has been a, a, a real waker up, uh, starting with Libya, because they feel that if this kind of com combined this new total war, including economics and politics, are, 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 are to be unleashed, the next target is going to be China and possibly the soft spot from where it will start is North Korea. The Russians are worried about the same thing. therefore they are saying we need a multipolar global order, order and they've been trying to draw us into that in in bricks we don't even know as far as i the way that i look at the public presentation of indian foreign policy these issues are not even be, being discussed they are being kept in the closed confines of the national security advisers office the foreign office to some extent and the prime minister and they, there's not even a, a discussion of what india should do in these things and wh whatever little discussion you find in the press is all in bilateral terms should we be friends with the us or with the chinese if we go with the chinese will offend the us if we, can we can we afford to su support syria and se and secular arab nations when in fact two thirds of our oil comes from these these these, these horrifying these horrid sheikhdoms well they are also our, our Uh, can can we uh, afford to to offend them when six billion of our people work in their in in their countries? Very Not realizing that if a hundred thousand of them went came back, the, their wages would double in these countries because they can't get them from anywhere else, and their economies would crash. We don't even know our power. Dr. Bhagwati, uh, Mr. Jha just referred to the wake up call coming out of the Arab Spring for China, and he mentioned Russia. Now, how do you look at? the russian reaction to what has happened in libya and what has happened in syria and our stand that we have taken we have as you know we have taken a somewhat cautious stand in terms of not going along with the kind of interventions that some of the western countries have uh, encouraged no i would tend to agree with what the government has uh, said uh, and and uh, i think it uh, makes sense for us to recognize Russia's interests in its near abroad and I'll stop there because I think that says it all mm -hmm. but I would like to go back to your original question to amplify a little bit on what I meant uh when I said that you know you put these two uh subjects in watertight compartments obviously our neighborhood is very important we need to work outwards from our neighborhood <clears throat> both uh in terms of security and in terms of our economic policy making but I think uh, to some extent uh we have been hampered by inadequate coordination between the two sides of rajpath 
I've been lucky. I've worked in the Ministry of Finance on the north side of Rajpath and in the Ministry of External Affairs on the south side. I'm not saying the east is east or the north is north and the south is south and never the twain shall meet. But I think we need much more effective coordination, not just at the ministerial level. For instance, uh, free trade agreements. I know that the Ministry of Commerce has a somewhat different opinion from the Ministry of Finance. Now, where does the government of India stand on it? And I could give you any number of examples. I know I strayed quite a bit from your question on Russia, but on Russia, if I now I'll come back to Russia, the bilateral relationship is very important for obvious reasons because we still have not been able to <coughs> diversify enough on our defense purchases. We are doing it, uh, and even irrespective of our defense relationship with Russia, we have a very strong relationship with them in terms of items of high technology. And I'll stop there.